In the White House, death can come creeping around every corner. The vast majority of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue's residents survived their stints there, but not everyone. This is the macabre history of all the people who passed away in the White House and the consequences of their deaths. William Henry Harrison famously enjoyed the shortest tenure of any United States president, making it only 32 days before he passed away. Diagnosed with pneumonia three weeks into his presidency, Harrison ended up being bedridden for about a third of his term. White House doctors tried everything that medical science had to offer in 1841. They administered bloodlettings, put suction cups on his chest, and gave him Ipecac. Alas, none of this made Harrison feel any better, so they moved on to boiling petroleum and snakeweed and feeding that to him. None of those options offered any hope either, and on April 4, 1841, the ninth American president passed away. The first president to die in office and the first recorded death within the walls of the White House, Harrison lives on in the urban legend that he wouldn't have gotten sick if he had just worn a coat in the cold. But in reality, Washington, D.C. wasn't exactly the cleanest city when compared to modern standards, and he probably died of typhoid. It wouldn't be long after Harrison's death before the White House saw another passing. Vice President John Tyler became the nation's new leader, and along for the ride was his wife, Letitia. The two of them seemed pretty happy together. Their correspondence during their courtship featured lines from John like, Whether I float or sink in the stream of fortune, you may be assured of this, that I shall never cease to love you. At 49 years old, Letitia suffered a stroke that left her paralyzed, and she wound up spending her time in the White House secluded in the upstairs living quarters. There's only one recorded instance of a public appearance from her, and she made the trek downstairs for her daughter's wedding in 1842. Later that same year, Letitia passed away at the age of 51 due to another stroke. John then remarried to 23-year-old Julia Gardner, who was 30 years his junior. 12th President Zachary Taylor, who was elected in 1848, came into office at an uneasy time for American politics. The debate over slavery was coming to a head, and the country was becoming more unwieldy with Taylor's predecessor James Polk's annexation of Texas and the incorporation of the territories in the Southwest. Clearly, Taylor had his work cut out for him. He also had to deal with the less-than-ideal safety standards of his era. Taylor had only been in office for a little over a year when he attended a Fourth of July celebration at a still-under-construction Washington Monument in 1815. The festivities were quite celebratory by mid-19th century standards. They had fruits, they had iced milk. That might sound tame to our 21st century ears, but times change, obviously. The big problem for Taylor wasn't the low energy standards for what constituted a good time back then. No, the issue was that Washington, D.C. still had a pretty severe sewage containment issue. Thus, eating open-air dairy brought with it the risk of contracting a bad case of cholera, which is likely what happened to Taylor. He died inside the White House less than a week later. In some ways, Abraham Lincoln is remembered today as less a man and more a concept. He's essentially the face of ideological martyrdom rather than a full human being in his own right. It can be easy to overlook the fact that he had a life outside of the events of the Civil War and the Gettysburg Address and being assassinated while attending a play. In 1862, Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd experienced a living nightmare when two of their sons, Tad and Willie, became gravely ill, possibly with typhoid. While Tad would eventually recover, Willie died on February 20th. He was only 11 years old. This was the second child the couple had lost following the death of their three-year-old Edward Baker Lincoln 12 years earlier. Mary would continue to live through personal tragedies with the assassination of her husband in 1865 and the death of Tad in 1871. Her remaining surviving child, Robert, made it into adulthood, though. He served as the 35th American Secretary of War, and he also had his mother committed to the Bellevue Place Sanitarium after a court determined that she was behaving irrationally. Mrs. Lincoln. Madam President, if you please. Frederick F. Dent is one of those historical figures who's more famous for who he's related to rather than any of his own personal accomplishments. He was a business owner and, like many people of his time, a slave owner. He reportedly only agreed to free his slaves when he was compelled to by the law of emancipation. He did all right for himself as a merchant, and he owned a steamboat and moved coffee and sugar shipments from Louisiana up the Mississippi River. And that's about all the historical record has to say about him. His obituary, which is displayed in the Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site Facebook page, is mostly just a list of people who showed up for his funeral. Dan did manage to become the father of a couple of noteworthy children, with perhaps the most famous being his daughter Julia. Julia grew up to marry military leader and 18th President Ulysses S. Grant, as she then served as First Lady during her husband's time in office. Frederick was staying at the White House during his son-in-law's tenure, and he died there in 1873. We all have that one friend who came back from Hawaii a changed person and insists that everyone they know must also go to Hawaii. But no matter how much that friend was transformed by that trip, 
there's a 0% chance that they liked it as much as Elisha Hunt Allen. Allen had all the prerequisites for falling in love with the Hawaiian Islands. He was a lawyer, so he was doing all right for himself. More importantly, he spent much of his life in Maine, so he probably spent a lot of time missing warmth. When he moved to what would eventually be the Aloha State, he advocated for American annexation and worked a number of high-profile jobs. This all culminated in his appointment as the Kingdom of Hawaii's Minister to the United States, an office he held for more than 25 years. During a New Year's celebration held by President Chester A. Arthur at the White House on January 1, 1883, though, Allen died suddenly at the age of 78. He was buried in Cambridge, Massachusetts, quite a ways from his longtime island home. 23rd President Benjamin Harrison is not the most famous American president ever, but he's at least known for serving longer than his grandfather, William Henry Harrison. He's also the answer to a trivia question as to the president who served between Grover Cleveland's two non-consecutive terms. His wife, Caroline Lavinia Harrison, was very big into White House renovations, history, and preservation. She helped to create the National Society of Daughters of the American Revolution, an organization comprised of female descendants of the United States founders. When she came to the White House, she was very interested in how the place worked. Caroline worked as a music teacher for much of her life, and she also suffered from what were some serious health issues. These included a bad case of pneumonia and, in 1892, tuberculosis. That disease was incurable back then, and the best a doctor could tell a patient to do was get plenty of rest and go live someplace dry, which would theoretically help the patient's lungs. So Caroline traveled to the Adirondack Mountains, but this change of scenery didn't do much to kill the bacteria inside her. She ultimately returned to the White House, where she passed away on October 25, 1892. Four years later, Benjamin Harrison married Caroline's niece, Mary, who was a quarter of a century younger than him. First Lady Ellen Wilson was the wife of 28th President Woodrow Wilson. From the available information on her, she was mostly a fairly decent person, so long as you put aside the fact that she traveled south for her pregnancy so that her children wouldn't be born as Yankees. Wilson herself was born into a southern family of slave owners, and she spent a good chunk of her time as First Lady trying to renovate largely African-American slums in Washington, D.C. Wilson also suffered from severe kidney disease, and on August 6, 1914, she died on White House grounds. Here's where things get a little scandalous. Seven months later, Woodrow Wilson was introduced to a recently widowed woman named Edith Galt. Wilson fell in love and soon proposed to her, which led to a lot of gossip spreading around the Capitol. There was even a rumor that Galt and the president had conspired to kill his first wife. But was any of this conjecture true in any way? No. But it does make one thing clear. The public discourse back in the day wasn't exactly much more civil than it is now in this country. What is there to say about the position of White House Press Secretary that White House Press Secretaries haven't already said themselves, then walked back, then reworded, then denied having ever said in the first place? Harry Truman's press secretary had the unenviable job of explaining to the country just exactly how a post-nuclear America was planning to get all of its responsibilities in order. When it came time to appoint somebody, Truman landed on a friend of his, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Charles Ross. The two men went so far back that they even graduated together from Independence High School in Missouri in 1901. In 1945, Ross took over for Jonathan W. Daniels, the last Franklin Roosevelt appointee to the position who only worked the job for a month and a half. Ross, on the other hand, would stay at his post until the moment he died. On December 5, 1950, he was sitting at his desk preparing comments for the TV news when he suffered a severe coronary occlusion, or blockage of the blood through the heart. He died right then and there at the age of 65. Plenty of people have probably had at least a sneaking suspicion at some point in their lives that their in-laws aren't their biggest fans. In many cases, that's probably just a bit of paranoia, but then there are those parents who actually really don't like their kids' spouses. In either case, there's not much of a chance that your in-laws think less of you than Margaret Wallace did of her son-in-law, and he was President of the United States. Margaret Wallace was the mother of First Lady Bess Truman, and she was not a fan of Harry Truman. That surely must have made things complicated when her daughter insisted that she be cared for in her old age at the White House. It was there that Margaret passed away on December 5, 1952. To date, she holds the distinction of being the last known person to die inside of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. There was also a famous streak of anti-Semitism in the Wallace family. On one occasion in 1961, TV producer David Susskind was working on a series of interviews with Harry Truman, who was then living at the Wallace family property. He informed Susskind that he couldn't come into the house because, quote, You're a Jew, David, and no Jew has ever been in the house. David, this is not the White House, it's the Wallace house. Bess runs it, and there's never been a Jew inside the house in her or her mother's lifetime. Evidently, the people who died in the White House weren't always the most considerate or decent human beings. 
Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about famous names are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.